Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Paco Douglas from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Uh, I hope that the uh, sound is uh, reaching you with uh, enough quality. Uh, I would like to uh, introduce the, uh, uh, the fourth Climate Europe webinar. Uh, Climate Europe is a European project, a coordinated and support action, which is coordinated by Chris Hewitt at the Met Office in the UK and uh, uh, as part of one of the work packages, work package four, uh, there is a series of webinars to create a network of uh, scientists and uh, pract uh, practitioners interested in the developments uh, in uh, observational, uh, and in, op in climate observations, uh, climate modeling infrastructure for the uh, development of uh, climate services. Uh, each webinar is uh, made of a couple of presentations, which uh, are uh, take around 15 to 20 minutes long. These presentations uh, are given uh, each time by people with uh, two slightly different profiles, so that they are complementary. And uh, at the end of the presentation, there is a round of uh, questions, or for for the attendants to to ask two or three questions to the uh, two speakers. Um, at the end of the two presentations, uh, depending on the time available, there is a couple of questions that you, uh, I'll show in a, in a minute that uh, you can uh, uh, have a look and uh, decide if you're interested in uh, formulating some questions. The speakers are uh, encouraged to think and uh, to shape their uh, presentations uh, according to these two questions, uh, which I read now, which challenges for climate modeling and obs observations are raised by climate services? This is the question one. The question two is uh, concerns the barriers that prevent a faster development of climate services market. So uh, the discussion is not necessarily focusing only on these two questions, but uh, these, que these two questions are expected to at least give a, 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 a sort of structure to the uh, final discussion. The two speakers that we have today are Carlo Buontempo from uh, the uh, Copernicus office at ECMWF in, uh, in the UK, in Reading, uh, who will introduce the Copernicus Climate Change uh, Service, and uh, uh, Mark Lineker from uh, Meteo Swiss, the uh, Swiss MET service in Switzerland, uh, who will talk about a user-relevant uh, climate prediction view. Um, so we'll start with Carlo. And uh, Carlo, I'll give you the uh, presentation rights. So I'll mute my microphone, and uh, from there you can you can take it up. Excellent. Thank you very much, Paco. Um, let me see how I can do the full screen. Uh, is it clear enough? Like this. Uh, full screen was yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much, and uh, I'm very pleased to, to be given the possibility of talking in this Climate Europe uh, webinar. I, I have been part of Climate Europe since the very beginning, and I'm very pleased to, to be here with you today presenting um, the Copernicus Climate Change Service. So, you may have heard about Copernicus Climate Change Service. I certainly gave a number of seminars on this topic and so did Januel and, and Vic in the last few uh, months. So I try to reshuffle the slide and present slightly a different point of view on, on, uh, on the Copernicus Climate Change Service. And also I try to frame it a bit around the two questions that Paco mentioned. So the talk is divided into two parts. The first part is a series of slides presenting what Copernicus is all about and what we are trying to achieve. And these are largely based on, on the work of my colleagues and, and myself, but also the contractors of Copernicus. Yeah, okay. um, the latest slides are reflecting more my point of view about the two questions that Paco was asking. So first of all, apologies, because I realized the long title I gave to the seminar doesn't quite fit the, uh, the slide I have, so I have to cut it a bit. Um, Copernicus is a, a, a wide, large, program of the European Commission is largely a satellite program that comes from GMIS. But Copernicus has been structured this, uh, this round around a number of services. So there are services for um, the, the land surface, for the marine security, and, and so on and so forth. And there is one for atmosphere and one for 
um, climate change, and these two services have been given to ECNWF, which is the entire entity, and run the program on the behalf of the Commission. So, um, in terms of what Copernicus provides, um, you can see from this slide that there is a number of observation, reanalysis, and not that the uh, uh, project that the program will provide access to. And this slide is color coded. So, what you see in green are actions that have started already, uh, like the, uh, the work on the global essential climate variable from satellite and in situ observation, and the uh, reprocessed climate data record. Um, there are other activities that are in process, so there is either a PIN or an ITT out, and there are some activities such as the couple climate reanalysis that haven't yet started. But this just to give you a quick overview of the kind of product and, um, well, even more than product, underpinning observation and data sets that are or will be soon available through the Copernicus Climate Change Service. <clears throat> and I would like just to highlight a number of products um, that Copernicus will provide access to because our I, I can hear some background noise. Can I uh, ask all, this, all the participants to mute their microphones, please? Um, so this is about reanalysis, and as uh, you may be aware, this is about ERA-5. ERA-5 is a new round of reanalysis, and will be provided by Copernicus, and is fairly high resolution with respect to what was available uh, in era interim, so we're talking about 31 uh, kilometer in horizontal resolution for 137 level in the vertical. But there are a few characteristics of these reanalysis that I think make them quite attractive for uh, climate services. One is the, um, is the fact that they will be provided in near real time, so data will be available within a week, possibly five days after the day they referred to. The second one is that um, they will be provided with a measure of uncertainty. So this is coming from an ensemble and there is an assessment of how, uh, you know, the spread of ensemble as a measure of, of the uh, uncertainty. Um, what you see in the top right plot is a comparison between era interim, which is the horizontal line, and the um, red line, which is this um, top line that appears from time to time, and um, being based on the on a recent version of the model, as you can see towards the, re the end of the observational record, um, the two coincide, and these are a measure of 200 millibar um, anomaly correlation. <coughs> there is also a, a work in progress in regional reanalysis, and there are two areas of focus. One is the European continent, and the other is the Arctic domain. And these are um, in process of being awarded. The other product I would like to highlight or make reference to is the seasonal prediction. So seasonal prediction will be provided, as we call the other data set free of charge, to anyone for any sort of purpose by Copernicus Climate Change Service. And this page you see is actually live, and you can go on the website and uh, look at this, at this plot. So there are plots, both global and regional, for uh, sea level pressure and geopotential height, precipitation and air temperature. They are um, in, in real time, so they are provided on the 15th of the month for the following uh, few months, and they will be updated every month. It's not just the graphical output, also the numerical output will be available as part of the climate data store. So um, the climate data store is certainly the central part of the CGS architecture, and I will say something more about it. But I want to just uh, to emphasize that the name store um, can be misleading in some respect. So nothing is there to be, to be sold, and it's not a storage place uh, as such. It's more a unique entry point to a number of data sets in a standardized way with clear metadata and tools to manipulate this uh, data set. So this is an example of what the toolbox uh, look, will look like. So the climate data store is in uh, alpha stage. Last week we got the alpha stage approval for the climate data store and it's a contract led by Telespazio in the UK and there will be a beta, a beta version by the summer. And the climate data uh, store toolbox is developed by an um, Italian IT company 
and is uh, working through an agile setup, so it's incremental in improvement and, and delivery. And what you see in, here in this plot is an example of what they are doing. In this case, it's a simple manipulation of different data sets, and so observation and climate projections and reanalysis just plot uh, together in one plot. What is interesting is this done on the fly. It's not just a static plot, it's, it's uh, responding to uh, the queries. And it's just one example, probably the first example we have, it's really working of the functionalities of the climate data store. So um, just to emphasize, the climate data store is much more than a storage of data. It's really a unique entry point to a standardized set of data set and the tools to manipulate them. So these are a, a graphic that you may have seen before, and as you can as you can see, the climate data store is certainly the central piece of the CTS architecture. But there are a number of other components. So I won't talk in any detail about evaluation quality control or the outreach and dissemination, but I want to emphasize a bit more the sectoral information system. So this is the part of of the program that I am directly responsible for, and in many ways it can be seen as the part of the program that translates um, the information, the tools, and uh, all that is available on the climate data store in order to make it relevant and usable um, for application in different sectors. So in, in many respects, it's the interface to the users. And going back to the questions that Paco was asking at the beginning, I think a lot can be learned on that interface. In this diagram, um, it's a bit unfortunately, but uh, unfortunate, but the, the arrow seems to go from the sectoral information system to the stakeholder alone. There are not many arrows back apart from the evaluation and quality control function. I think we need really to emphasize the importance of those feedbacks and the importance of understanding um, what the user need and want, and now these needs are translating to research questions. So this is partially addressed by the, the quality control function, but is, um, it should be much more um, wide and affecting the different parts of the, of the program. So um, within the sectoral information system, we have a number of sectors that we are looking at. And here you see uh, those that we, we are um, looking at with, with um, more focus in, in some respect. Those that have a green tick uh, are the sectors that we have already addressed through the seven contracts that we have awarded so far. So we have two contracts for water, two for energy, one for agriculture, one looking at cities and covering partially health and infrastructure, and one covering um, insurance. As you may be aware, there are at the moment um, uh, two ITTs or one ITT for two lots out to cover further sectors and to also look at um, global climate services. So if you're interested, please visit the relevant page on the CNWF website. Um, there are, as I said, there are seven sectors and I won't have time here to go into, sorry, there are seven contracts and I won't have time here to go um, into the details of what they have done and what they are trying to achieve, but I try to give a, a quick synoptic overview of the main result. So this is a slide coming out of one of um, our energy projects, and this is the one led by UEA in the UK, in particular by Alberto Troccoli. And uh, I want to use this slide, it's quite nice, but mainly to make a point that all these contracts we have are based and rooted in existing issues of, of the user. So in this case, the issue they are looking at is uh, for the energy sector, and it's really about the challenge posed by uh, climate change to the sector. So on one side, you have the increasing number of renewable uh, into the energy mix, which by their very nature provide extra variability and volatility to the, uh, to, the, to the market. And on the other side, you have an underlying change in the climate, which means that it's not, it's not a, a given that resources that are performing well now will keep performing in the future. And in any way, uh, you need to assess how the climate variability affects the energy mix. So this is really what you're, what you're looking at, within this, what we are looking at in this project. But the point I'm making is that every single one of the, of the uh, contract we have is really linked to one or more user-relevant issues. So the second point, and this is a slide taken from EDGE. EDGE is one of the water projects we have and is led by CEH. 
Um, and the point I'm making here is that the user and the user interaction is not something happening just at the beginning of the project in the definition of, of the problem, if you want, but is a continuous process that affects every, every step in, in the development of the service and delivery of the service. So in, in the case of this contract, this is done through focus groups. There are other ways of doing it, but the important bit is that uh, we are quite keen for each one, each and every one of the contract we have to have this continuous engagement with the user and ensuring that the views of the user is uh, accounted for at every single step. So again, it's just a, one example from one project, but it's valid for all of them. Um, this is an, a slide coming from Suica, another water project. And I think this is quite important because um, it's linked to the equilibrium, you know, the balance we need to find between trying to meet the needs of the user and maintaining enough distance from the end user to allow uh, a market uh, of climate services to develop and, and exist. So if you, if you try to address the need of every single user, then, well, first of all, probably we won't be able to do it ourselves because it would be uh, a daunting task. But on the other side, you don't, you don't really leave enough space for, uh, for the market to evolve and, and develop, which is very much what the European Commission wants. So providing uh, this um, project is interesting because it was designed thinking in terms of users, um, I mean, targeting as users, the intermediaries, the purveyors, the consultants, and is really working with them, trying to understand what is the provision of, of, uh, of the data that can serve them best. So again, I think it is, um, in one sense, it's quite unique to this contract. On the other, on the other hand, it provides a really useful um, way of understanding what a good proposition for climate service may look like. Um, and still, these are slides from Suica. Each one of these uh, contract has developed or is in, in the process of developing a demonstrator um, a user interface that provides access to data. So what you see here is the one from Suica, and in this case is something related to uh, the water quality, the nitrogen content, uh, nitrogen load in, in the different river basin. And the point I want to make here is the fact that in order to have a meaningful and constructive conversation with the users, you need to have something to show them. Um, so the approach they have taken here was to deliver something, even if suboptimal and improvable, something quite early on, and then build and modify that something in collaboration and in close interaction with the user. I think this is an important lesson to be learned here because it's very difficult to maintain and sustain a long conversation with the users if you don't have anything that is practical and meaningful uh, for, to show to them. So um, I guess from this and the other contract, this is a lesson that we should keep in mind. It has been incredibly useful in, in this case, as it has been with the other, to have something tangible to show. And I'm sure that if you have time and navigate the system, you will find things that can be improved. And so if you do, please let us know and we'll feed, feed this comment back to the developers. And having this meaningful conversation is, is crucial because allow you to focus on what are the issues that are really relevant to the user. So this is an example from our uh, agricultural contract. So this is a contract looking at um, services for the agriculture and they are targeting three um, main um, areas. So one production, uh, olive oil, and forests. So in this case, the graph you look here is the harvest time for, uh, for grapes in uh, a region of southwest France um, as a function of time for two different emission scenarios. You know, if, you, if you're not familiar with uh, viniculture, then you may, may think that probably for farmers in general, the most important, imp the most important variable is the um, yield, you know, how much they will make out of, of a specific field. Well, for viniculture, not surprisingly, actually the most important parameter is the quality. So they control, they have ways of controlling the yield, but what, is really matter, what really matters is the quality of the wine. And the quality of the wine is dependent on the harvest time, because if you uh, have to harvest very early, because the, the berries have reached maturity, then you may actually change significantly the sugar content, which means the alcohol in the final wine, and the organolect organolectic nature of the berries. So there is a reason for concern and may have practical implications as it indicates for the production of, uh, of an appellation wine. What I mean here is that 
the engagement with the user allow us to focus on an, of an issue that is relevant to the user without getting to the point, starting from preconceived idea of what is relevant and what is not. So um, I'm just reaching my two, last two slides. And as I said at the beginning, these are more my reflection rather than an organic outcome of Copernicus and should be seen as that. So I think I try to focus uh, on a few important points. The first one is that really, as I was saying in my previous slide, if we don't want to become as a solution in search of a problem, we shouldn't preempt the discussion with the user. We shouldn't think that we know what they, what they want and what is relevant for them, because often it's not the case. And so just to be a bit provocative here, which is always good in the, in the seminar, part of the skill or quality is in the eye of the beholder. So we like to think that we know what constitutes quality for, for a user or quality or skill for a, a prediction. And in many cases we do. But in some cases, actually, the definition of that depends on what is the use of that information. And in a sense, our climate models are very good at generating a lot of data. And part of this data is useful to someone for some decision, but we often don't know which one and when and how. So there was a good example from Mark Payne, who was a scientist um, working on a European project called NACLIM. And he has a model um, of biology and, and, and fish in, uh, in the North Atlantic. So he can predict um, fish stock. So he was very keen to engage with fisheries because he thought that he, he can predict quota in the future. And fisheries were not at all uh, interested, you know, fisher, fishing company in that. But they were much more interested in understanding the seasonality of, of fish in the future. So engaging with them actually, he managed to refocus uh, on a problem that was much more relevant and it was also more addressable. Uh, for him. So it's just an example of the power of changing that approach. And then I have another little provocation because we often hear about um, user fatigue and the fact that we keep interviewing and uh, asking questions to the users. And, you know, and, and, and there is concern of that. But I think we should also ask why. My last slide and then wrap up. Um, so uh, the other question that Paco asked at the beginning is, um, you know, what does it mean, climate service? What are uh, the impact on research? What, what, what are the questions that climate services open for research? First of all, I, I want to stress here that not all research needs to serve the needs of, of the service. So there is, there is a, an important scope for fundamental research on climate, and we don't need to focus everything on climate services. Said that, um, for the part of the science that wants to be um, service relevant, I think the, the important aspect is really uh, focusing on the translation back. So we have put a lot of effort, or we are putting a lot of effort in translating the need, in translating um, you know, the science toward the users. And I think we should, and we are already doing a bit, we should put more focus in translating the need of the users into fundamental research questions. And this has implications. So there was an example from Swiss Re last year at the innovation conference that Kane and I organized. And what they were saying there is that, for instance, they're using seasonal prediction not because of their predictive power, because in Europe the predictive power of seasonal prediction is limited, so the skill, if you want, of seasonal prediction is limited. But they are using seasonal prediction as generator of realistic um, you know, timeline of evolution of the system. And if that's the case, if this is the way in which the climate predictions are used, well, this has implications on what we could focus on in terms, in, in terms of realism and reliability of this prediction that potentially can become more important than the skill. So um, I just uh, um, leave, some, leave you with some possible challenges. Um, on one hand, from the interviews and interaction we had, there is a need for meaningful high-resolution fields. So looking at the users, a message is coming out is that the temporal resolution of the data set they are using is reasonable, while the uh, spatial resolution is often too coarse. And I would like to add, I mean, meaningful for me is that um, it's not just the, the raw resolution. We need to understand where the skill is and whether there is information at that, that very high resolution. Um, the second point is about skill. And we have our usual benchmark for 
skill and quality. And I think something we could do is to focus on what is the user next best alternative. So if the user didn't have access to our wonderful forecast, what do they use, would they use? And how well, our, or, or not so well, our forecast compared to that? The way of phrasing that I think is quite important because, for instance, we use climatology often as a margin, as a benchmark for prediction, but the user can do much better than climatology without spending a fortune. So having realistic benchmark that represent user next best alternative, I think would be quite useful. And using those as a benchmark for our prediction is a good idea. Uh, the last one uh, is coming from a number of uh, user input. And I see this as, as becoming an issue. So how we define what is the best way of generating a near present day climate in a situation where climate is not stationary. Um, I'm happy to expand further on this question, but just in for, for time, I, I finish here. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Carlo. That was very much to the point and uh, brief enough. So uh, very enlightening. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, if uh, there is anyone uh, attending who would like to uh, formulate a great question to, to Carlo, please uh, put yourself forward. Uh, this is Slobodan Nitschkovic from Belgrade. Uh, Carlo, I have two questions. Uh, one, uh, uh, are there already uh, some connections or co uh, collaboration with the WMO programs like uh, uh, Global uh, Framework for Climate Services and uh, uh, seasonal, uh, sub-seasonal to seasonal program as well? That's one thing. The second one, what is your opinion? What uh, sector uh, could be uh, among the first successful uh, users of, of the Copernicus data in the future. Okay, well, thank you for, for the questions. Um, yes, there are, there are links with WMO initiatives. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be otherwise. And uh, um, I, I guess one of the issues we had is that the program is very young and very dynamic, and we had uh, quite, a, quite a bit to do over the last few months in just setting up and organizing the program now is, is becoming a, a priority to really uh, um, engage more with these initiatives. And uh, um, so Jean-Noël Sepo, who is the uh, director of the Copernicus Climate Change Service, um, is now writing a white paper with Chris Hewitt about the connection between Copernicus and um, GSCS, really to strengthen those links. So these are things that are happening, and we really look forward to to have a closer collaboration and alignment with the WMO uh, initiatives. The second point was about um, w w was about sectors and which which are the sectors that are um, you know probably best positioned to take advantage of, of this. Um, but it's difficult to say in the sense that there are some sectors that naturally will be in a very good position, um, but maybe because of their history or. Um, skill set or capacity within those sectors are uh, a bit behind. So, in a sense, I would expect that agriculture and, and land management would take, uh, you know, on the medium term, can take a huge advantage of preventive services. At the moment, they are in so much. Um, so, if you look at the, at the sectors that are have been most active, I would probably think that water and energy are a bit ahead. Especially, you know, within energy, there, there is a long history of dealing with climate information, and there is, um, within organizations, companies, and intermediaries, there is a lot of knowledge and, and capacity and skill. So they are taking advantage of that. That is also partially the case for water, in that in water, especially at the purveyor level and consultancy level, there is a lot of um, capacity to, to deal with this information. Um, but in terms of end user, it's a bit, it depends a lot, it's a bit more patchy in Europe. But I would think these two sectors are probably a bit ahead. Thanks, Carlo. I suggest that we move on and uh, uh, listen to Mark Lineker, and then probably we can engage into a, a lengthier discussion at the end of the, uh, the webinar. Um, Mark, I'm, I'm going to share the uh, presentation rights with you. Um, well, thanks a lot um, for inviting me, and um, also uh, uh, to Carlo for his very interesting uh, talk. Um, 
my presentation will be complementary in the sense that it is probably more technical, more more specific problem specific, uh, but I, I hope they will kind of uh, match uh, together. So um, my name is Mark Leniger. I'm head of climate predictions at Meteo Swiss, and I would acknowledge a number of people um, uh, listed in the lower part of the slide. Actually, I try to use the pointer. I hope this is visible. And uh, I will talk about climate predictions uh, and in particular uh, on the use of climate indices. Uh, but to start with, I would like to give you um, an example um, on climate scenarios. Actually, as some of you might know, uh, we in Switzerland have uh, published, uh, elaborated and published climate change scenarios for Switzerland in 2011. And you see, can see a, a typical graph on the right hand side uh, uh, as we show this information um, uh, to the public, to the policymakers, and so on. So the most important information is clearly uh, are these bars on the right hand side. They show the seasonal mean change, in this case of temperature in northeastern Switzerland. You can see for, for this particular uh, period and for several uh, emission scenarios, these change signals. Already at that time, we realized that it is very important uh, to combine this information with uh, uh, historical data to put this into a context. So this is why we also show here uh, observations of the past. Uh, and also, in terms of a climate service, we uh, have decided to update these figures. So you can see this clearly here. The, pub, uh, the report was published in 2011, but this figure uh, is continuously updated with uh, most recent data. So in this case, we, for example, you can see summer 2015 uh, and also summer 2016 in the graph. So people can continuously uh, put uh, the current climate into this uh, climate change context. But nevertheless, uh, it, it was clear that many users struggle uh, in relating seasonal mean temperature um, to, uh, to themselves, to uh, their decisions. And uh, so uh, we decided to move more towards uh, climate indices. Uh, this is a typical climate index uh, as tropical nights. Uh, uh, these are t this is T minimum above 20 degrees. You can see here a time series uh, for Zurich. So we don't have many tropical nights in Zurich. Uh, this is uh, 2015, the peak. Uh, quite interesting, by the way, that uh, far more tropical nights in 2015 than in 2003. Um, but um, this is uh, something people can relate uh, themselves to. Uh, the tropical nights, these are nights you cannot sleep well, uh, the houses do not cool down anymore, uh, so they are not comfortable. So uh, we converted the seasonal mean changes uh, to uh, a statement about these indices. Uh, um, so we did a temporal disaggregation and applied these changes um, in temperature, seasonal mean changes of temperature to a gridded station. And based on that, we could uh, provide um, maps for the current uh, climate and also for the future climate. So on the current climate, you see we have hardly any tropical nights and for the future climate it becomes obvious that many regions of Switzerland, in particular the lowlands here and in the southern part, you will experience 10 up to 20 tropical nights per year. So it turned out that this was a very successful way in communicating climate change uh, to, the, to the public but also to policymakers. This was really something people could um, uh, uh, make sense of. Uh, they, they understood what the implications are and uh, this uh, was a kind of a success in a qualitative uh, way. But we also uh, could use these indices in a quantitative way. Uh, I will like to show you an example for road salt use in Switzerland. So we had a project with the Swiss uh, producer of road salt. This is a monopoly. It's a state-owned um, uh, company, and they produce road salt for entire Switzerland. This is um, uh, for, for data analysis is quite nice, so because uh, the data is, is kind of clear. You can see here the road salt use in this graph. There is uh, some trend. This is mostly due to technology, te technological changes. Uh, but you can also see a very strong internal variability, and this is mainly due to climate variability. So we related this road salt use to uh, snow days and um, uh, defined uh, like, like uh, precipitation on, on cold days. And you can see here, for, this is for one canton, one region of Switzerland, you, uh, you find perfect correlation. 
information. It's actually not snow days just averaged over the whole domain. It's uh, snow days uh, averaged along the roads. So we combined that with uh, geographical information system. But uh, uh, this uh, worked very nicely uh, for this region here. You have a correlation of 0 0.93. So uh, yeah, I think you don't have to argue about that. Uh, in mountainous regions, it's not so perfect, but still, I think the main uh, variability is visible. And uh, so based on this relationship, it was quite straightforward to um, derive climate change scenarios for road salt use. And one could, um, uh, for example, here you can see uh, the consequences for the canton of Zurich. This is uh, where Meteor Swiss is located, where I live. Uh, you can see the road salt use uh, of current, uh, current road salt use is about 30 thousand tons and this will go towards down towards uh, around 10,000 tons uh, towards the end of the century. So you have a significant increase and this information could be directly used by this uh, Schweizer Salinen. Uh, they uh, take this information to plan their infrastructure, to plan their storage capacities and um, uh, so we could uh, help them with that. So kind of a, a short um, kind of uh, setup, uh, I, I see or I define indices as a scalar value derived from daily, usually daily metrological variables. These indices are usually nonlinear functions. They can include counts or uh, aggregation above a threshold and things like that. And uh, very important to us is uh, they relate to the users. This can be in a quantitatively way uh, as for the road salt or also in a qualitatively way uh, as for the heat. Uh, and uh, many uh, applications need, this local, need actually local information, but uh, uh, luckily the decisions are not, made, are not made on a local scale, but on rather on a larger scale. So the accuracy on a point level is actually not so crucial. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, the georeferencing is important and uh, you have to uh, be able to aggregate this information to um, a particular <laughs> Okay. Sorry, Mark. You can you can go ahead. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the person. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Okay. Um, so I, I will go now to climate prediction. So it's a good moment um, uh, for a little break. Um, we also look to climate uh, indices in in predictions. So on the upper panel, you see. Um, uh, the scale, the correlation scale of seasonal mean temperature um, uh, for summer predictions. And uh, you can see um, that there is some uh, nice scale here in Western US or also in Southern Europe. And in the lower panel, you see uh, an index which is somehow um, representing heating degree days in a more general way. It's the aggregate temperature uh, above the 19th percentile. And what is quite nice to see is that these patterns relate quite nicely to each other. So the regions of high skill here for the index are very similar to the regions you find in the seasonal mean temperature. This relation is actually so nice that it was possible to set up a model, uh, a statistical model to predict the skill of the climate index based on the seasonal mean temperature. This is what is shown in the lowermost panel. Uh, you can see here, uh, uh, the skill map uh, derived from the statistical model in predicting the skill uh, for this particular index. And you can see that this matches these, uh, these regions and uh, these patterns match uh, the actual skill of the index quite nicely. So there is a link between the skill in seasonal mean temperature to the skill of the index. And um, this helps uh, in uh, e providing information to users what the skill of such an index is, because it's not possible to do skill calculations for each index separately. Uh, uh, but um, it's, it's more, much far more straightforward to, present, to provide information on seasonal mean quantities. And this is what we did. I will skip this slide and will present directly this. This is a tool we have developed within Euporius uh, that presents a skill uh, for, uh, for all forecasting uh, times, for all starting months of system two, season WF system four, for all tortured seasons, different skill scores, different temporal resolutions, and uh, temperature and 
precipitation and you can explore interactively uh, the scale of the system and uh, Based on that, uh, you can also um, decide uh, if the system provides enough information that you might uh, uh, calculate the climate index um, of the data and, and use it for your decisions. In this particular case, you can see the rank, uh, continuous rankability skill score uh, for Europe for the prediction of um, spring, March, April, May, started in February. So uh, this is the forecast that will be issued in about two weeks time. And uh, it seems there is some skill actually in Europe uh, for this uh, region, uh, so we can look forward to the forecast. This will go, uh, uh, by the way, this, uh, this work uh, is also feeding in a project of the C3S, so uh, this is the link to Carlos' presentation now. Um, uh, we have a, a project together with, uh, led by Barcelona Supercomputing Center, where we assess the skill in a systematic way, a way of the seasonal forecasting C3S. Um, so there are still some challenges, though, um, uh, in, in these indices, uh, because uh, one of the big issues is that you have usually absolute thresholds uh, or, and you need a, a bias correction, you need biased uh, downscaling, uh, and this is uh, hampered by uh, usually not well-defined climatologies. Uh, it's not so clear how to deal with uh, multivariate indices, uh, uh, sub-daily information, uh, also, the availability of observations can be a challenge. As an example, uh, just a kind of illustration, you can see here um, uh, the, the um, uh, topography of a state-of-the-art climate model uh, that is uh, uh, part of Eurocortex, uh, Euro and you can see the Alps are quite coarse. And when, in particular, when you think of how then particular meteorological stations are located in a valley, you have local cloud systems and uh, different uh, climatological uh, situations very uh, nearby. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I have a few examples on these challenges, uh, just uh, selected a few. Um, one is the, the climatology. Uh, to do a bias correction, you need a, a well-defined climatology on a daily level because we work with indices. We need to daily data, and this is uh, kind of uh, presenting or showing you uh, how the daily climatology would look like. This is this black line if you just use the corresponding calendar day of the past 30 years. So um, this is a perfect model approach, but um, uh, it comes down if you just use uh, your observations, you have just 30 years of data, uh, you, you end up with this uh, wobbling line here with this black line. And it's obvious that uh, this climatology uh, has variability variance uh, that changes within a few days that are not uh, realistic uh, or in the order of, uh, of one, one degree. Um, so in the perfect model approach, it was possible using the climate prediction to um, uh, derive a kind of an ideal climatology. So we could use um, uh, uh, here uh, 30 years time 51 members. So we have a huge sample to estimate this climatology. And even with such a large sample, you see in this red line, uh, there's still wiggling. So at the end, it's actually not enough, um, uh, even with these 51 members. Anyway, uh, uh, in this uh, study, we propose then to use a less uh, smoothing. You could also use other kind of smoothing, but uh, you definitely need a, a smoothing uh, to uh, approximate such a daily climatology that then can be applied uh, for a bias correction. Uh, another challenge I would like to mention is the multivariate bias correction. This is also an issue. Uh, this is work from the uh, Horizon 2020 project Heat Shield. This is about uh, heat stress to uh, working people. Uh, and um, in this project, we look by, by, uh, to different indices like uh, wet bulb temperature. This is a multivariate index that describes uh, heat exposure, and it's a function of uh, temp temperature and humidity. And uh, we investigated how uh, you could do a bias correction for these indices, uh, for this index. And in this case, we applied a quantile mapping for temperature to many stations and for specific humidity separately, also by quantile mapping, and then calculated the index based on this uh, bias corrected um, data uh, and uh, resulting in a plot like this here on the right hand side. It, it turns out that it matches quite nicely with the observations. So for this particular index, 
um, a bias correction separately on the underlying meteorological parameters is successful, but um, it's not so clear how to generalize these results. This might look different in a, for other multivariate indices and uh, is certainly something that has to be explored in more depth. So um, uh, I would like to, as a, as a last example, I would look, like to make kind of a real-world example. Uh, we have currently quite a strong drought in southern Switzerland, uh, and this drought results also in a fire hazard uh, uh, warning. So you can see here uh, in, in the Ticino, um, uh, you, you might know this is the part, uh, Italian-speaking part of Switzerland. We have a high danger of a fire forest fire. Uh, this uh, has already happened actually. There were some forest fires a few weeks ago uh, and uh, the question is will this uh, situation um, stay? Will we still have a uh, fire risk in a few weeks time? And when you just look to kind of the conventional uh, sub-seasonal forecast, monthly forecasts, uh, you, 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 you might get a product like this. It's actually a product of Meteor Swiss, so <laughs> uh, this is what we provide uh, for to the public. And you can see there is a slight increased probability. Uh, this is the, the upper tercile uh, of humid conditions, so there is, you can expect some precipitation in the week two. Uh, this is uh, here, uh, um, unfortunately, behind uh, the video. Um, uh, so this is the forecast from last Friday uh, for the first week of February, and you can see, well, there, there might be some precipitation. But for a, for a user, for a person that has to decide on the uh, forest fire risk, uh, this is probably not the best in kind of information. So as an example, I show you here the standardized precipitation evapotranspiration index. This index uh, is running on a six-monthly window. So it, it aggregates information over a longer period, which is very important for forest fire. And uh, you can see the past condition here on the left-hand side. You can see we had continuously very dry conditions uh, in, in, in the southern part of Switzerland. This is uh, close to two standard deviations. And when we integrate the forecast, so you can see here the 40 days of uh, monthly forecast uh, applied to this index, you can see that it's very likely that we don't get a relief of this drought uh, for the current uh, for the next month and the situation is even if you have precipitation will, will still be uh, severe so this was my last example I have a brief uh, um, summary slide um, I think uh, um, climate indices can make climate information more user relevant um, and at the same time uh, climate indices have advantages they are poor meteorological so they are quite easy to calculate and uh, also very important to mention they are observable. So uh, this is a quantity that has a, a clear definition. You can go out to a meteorological station and actually measure it. And this uh, makes it possible to verify, for example, uh, also for predictions, but um, uh, also for the past. Then uh, prediction skill uh, is in generally lower than for mean quantities, um, but I'm still um, kind of in favor uh, of using such indices by, because uh, this uh, lower prediction skill is, is compensated in many cases by a higher user relevance. And also this might uh, have to be added that uh, I have not shown it, but uh, in some cases the these climate indices have also a better reliability because the calculation of indices adds some noise uh, to, to uh, the data and uh, this usually kind of um, overcomes a bit the overconfidence that is uh, an issue in seasonal forecasts. However, the calculation is expensive. Um, uh, you have to deal with large data amounts, uh, cal calibration is needed, but nevertheless, in most cases, it's less complex than running an impact uh, modeling chain. And I think, and, and this is my final point, uh, that this concept can be applied in a consistent way to historical data, seasonal forecasts, climate change scenarios. So it's a, it's a really general context. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I have some slides on the questions that have been raised, but I don't know if, um, if um, this is, uh, can be done uh, afterwards. Uh, yeah, we, we could probably go into, into that in a, in a few minutes. Uh, we might uh, probably uh, uh, have a, a, some questions from the, uh, from the audience for what you have shown up, up to now. So uh, if anyone is interested in uh, asking a question to Mark, please uh, just unmute your microphone and uh, go ahead.
I, I try to introduce yourself uh, before you, you, you raise the question. Um, hi, I'm uh, Ilian Locke from SMHI, Sweden, and uh, I would like to ask a question on this uh, skill prediction that you uh, showed uh, regarding uh, the users being involved, what that looks like, because uh, I often heard that uh, this prediction skill is something that the user find very uh, difficult to understand. Uh, so do you have anything to say about that? The, the slide you showed on that is... Uh, do the users find that understandable? Uh, well, that's a very interesting point because indeed uh, communicating skill is, is not straightforward. So um, there are, I think, uh, several approaches to that. So uh, in one case, uh, we have uh, quite um, educated users, uh, like maybe from big companies that are used to deal with uh, risks. Uh, and um, so for these, people uh, such uh, an online tool to explore um, skill uh, is, is actually helpful. We already received uh, uh, feedbacks from several uh, users. But for a more general kind of user, this is uh, certainly not the way to go. I mean, this is very technical. You have to understand this, uh, what these skill scores mean and uh, what the, this uh, data is actually representing. So we have try to go different, uh, try to different, different solutions. So one solution is to make the forecast more reliable. Uh, uh, and having a forecast fully reliable does imply that the probabilities forecasted are actually the, uh, re uh, related to the skill. So if the system has no skill, you just forecast uh, 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 climatology. So, um, so you can actually integrate this predict prediction skill into the forecast. So this is one approach. But never, even that is not um, uh, ideal for some, some users. And uh, we are experimenting at the moment uh, for, for monthly forecasts with other means of communication, like, for example, stars uh, that uh, highlight um, situations with strong scale or, or weak scale. Um, uh, I don't know, stars like, like you have in um, TripAdvisor or so, so that is uh, somehow making, uh, trying to communicate this information in a, in a simple way. But then you, you lose some information, obviously. Any, any other questions? Uh, Mike, I have a question for you concerning the, uh, the bias correction. Um, you, 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 you've, you've raised as a challenge, the uh, bias correction of uh, more than one variable. So you showed the, the example of, I think it was wet bulb temperature as, yep. uh, as something that requires more than one variable to be bias corrected. Mm -hmm. the, the problem with uh, using quantile mapping individually for each one of the, uh, the variables is that the covariances between the temperature and the specific humidity are not maintained. Yeah. So yeah. Have you, have you considered other approaches that allow the uh, bias correction of more than one variable uh, in a different framework, like such as, for instance, data simulation, uh, in, in, in a similar way as, as to what is done to initialize the, uh, uh, the focus uh, systems? Yeah, uh, well, actually, we have not, uh, uh, not more complex uh, approaches. Um, I mean, we, we have also used, uh, for example, delta change, but this is uh, kind of quite re uh, related to uh, quantum mapping. But uh, this might be very interesting indeed. Uh, I think uh, there are also these, uh, these uh, shuffling approaches uh, where you uh, kind of resample re your, your data that might also be a, a promising approach. We have also experimented uh, with uh, weather generators that are also a possibility. Uh, but on the other side, you uh, have to make a lot of assumptions then uh, again in the weather generator and you, uh, you also suffer from, from the design of the weather generator to some extent. So, and, and it's also uh, the development of a weather generator is also quite uh, a lot of work. So we, uh, there are some approaches that uh, might uh, be, uh, might, might uh, deal with this problem in a better way. It's always a bit of a question of um, price and, uh, and, and benefit, yeah. Okay, thank you. So if there are no more questions, I don't know if there are any questions here. Uh, if there are no more questions. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, can, can you introduce yourself? Sorry, Raul, I think I, 
Ralph, I think I, I muted you. Could you please start again? Yes, my name is Ralph Dusche from SMHI and I have a question concerning a uh, comment concerning bias corrections. So uh, even when we look at longer time sets for, for climate uh, projections, then we, I think we need to consider climate the, the bias correction as part of the answer, part of the chain of uncertainty. And um, a colleague of mine here at SMHI, Gregory Nicolin, he's trying to, uh, initial, to to start a bias correction intercomparison project. I think this focuses more on uh, longer time scales, not that much on short-term climate prediction, but uh, maybe some results can be shared. So it would be interesting maybe um, if um, people engage um, in that kind of project intercomparison of uh, bias corrections and uh, so understand this as part of the uncertainty chain. Yeah, I fully agree. I mean, uh, the, uh, it's, uh, the, the more complexity you add, you also you in include more uh, uncertainties, and uh, this has certainly to be uh, taken into account. We are in exchange, actually, with Grisha, so uh, uh, we, we know each other, and um, uh, this is uh, it's such exchanges. Also, what has uh, been done in cost value project is is a very um, uh, valuable. Um, uh, approach uh, to understand what are the strengths and weaknesses of different approaches. There is no Solomonic solution. And I think this is uh, what everybody uh, has, has learned uh, in, the, in the past years. It's, there's no way how to do it in all the cases. You have to think about the current situations, also about the sensitivities of the users. I mean, it's, you know, the, the downscaling is somehow uh, user um, uh, driven also. But thanks for the comment, yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, maybe, Mark, uh, we can go through your, uh, we can go quickly through your overhead uh, to address the, uh, the two questions. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. Uh, I just add, go to the slides again because uh, uh, I have a few comments on these two questions. Uh, uh, one, the first question is what challenges for climate modeling and observations are raised by climate services? And I have uh, listed a few uh, that relate a bit to my presentation, uh, obviously, but maybe also a bit more to my experience in general. Uh, I, if you don't interrupt me, I just go through the slide. So, uh, <laughs> um, I, I think one of the biggest challenge um, uh, is is localized information. So people really they live uh, in, in, in cities, they live in, in very specific locations, they have their production sites somewhere, and they need information on these spots. Um, then uh, another challenge is uh, a fast delivery, and this is not only in terms of dissemination, but also in terms of short development phase. If you, if you as a user go to a, a service, climate service provider, uh, you, you, you tell them their problem and they say, well, we need first a few PhDs, and then a few years later we might have a solution how to do this. Uh, this is not the way to go. I mean, uh, you, you really need a, an answer within a few weeks, and uh, you need a solution that can be implemented uh, also in this time scale. But again, the high reliability in terms of dissemination is an important issue. I mean, if you are not capable to provide this information on a regular basis uh, with a high reliability and a technical reliability, uh, then uh, users get tired uh, of, of this. Uh, they, they won't look, they won't integrate this information into their decision process. Then obviously comprehensiveness is an issue uh, in terms of time scales, variables, and so on. It needs also to be simple, uh, simple in terms of communication. Uh, as the question we had just before, like skill, it's, it's difficult to co uh, communicate skill in a simple way. Uh, but also the underlying method needs to. There, needs, there is not, the, the methods need to be simple in a way that the users believe that this method is somehow really tackling the problem. If you really come with very complex statistical methods nobody understands, this can be a barrier to the users. And then, uh, as also mentioned already, the reliability in a statistical sense, uh, you have to include the full, full uncertainties. Uh, this is uh, something we have been, I mean, uh, we all are working uh, daily on this issue, uh, but uh, it's, we're still struggling with doing so. So I think this is uh, still a challenge. 
Um, on the second question, um, uh, what are the barriers that prevent the faster development of a climate services market? I mean, some of the comments before also relate to this question, but I think um, it's still an issue that the data amount and also the data complexity is a challenge. I mean, we, we are dealing here with uh, petabytes. We have uh, 5D fields just for one variable. Uh, it's, it, this is it's somehow... Uh, uh, this is a real challenge. And then openness, um, and here I, I would like to stress we are not only talking here about open data uh, of Meteo service providers, but I'm also talking here about the willingness to share data in the other way, in the other direction. It's also very often a challenge to, to get uh, data from, uh, from the users because only the combination of this data um, uh, is actually uh, making uh, the, the added value, is actually providing an added value. And uh, in, in a commercial environment, this is some very often very uh, challenging because this is uh, key market data. They don't want to publish that kind of data. And uh, this makes things uh, quite difficult. And then uh, this is more like an internal problem we have, uh, and I think uh, nobody working in the med service is disputing that. Uh, also in research, we have barriers between uh, weather forecasting between, and climate predictions and also climate change research. And um, this is also partially just because the research field is very wide, but I think we should overcome these barriers uh, as much as possible because the users, they don't make these differences. They don't uh, separate between weather and climate. It's the same for them. Uh, some other issues uh, that could be mentioned is that just the science is evolving very fast. So the, it's not only that the climate is not stationary, but it's also that state of the art itself is not stationary. And um, I think this is uh, also a challenge for, uh, for the users to adopt techniques because they know, well, in a year's time, there will be another technique that is even better. So what should I do? And, uh, and then I think as a last point that is also kind of making the stressing the fact that we need climatologists is that the climate system is just too complex to, uh, to, 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 to solve the data uh, in a, in a data-driven approach. So it's, it's just we don't have enough observations to actually understand the phase space poorly uh, by data. We have to understand the physical processes that are underlying the climate system, and uh, we need this knowledge to make meaningful use of the data. And I think this understanding of the climate system is something uh, we should not forget, because most of the big progresses in, in this field, and also in terms of making data more meaningful, comes from the understanding of the pro climate. Yeah, this was, uh, these were my points. Okay, thanks a lot, Mark. Uh, I, actually, I, I quite like your last point there because there, there seems to be a, a, a growing interest on uh, new, new techniques or techniques that have not been widely applied in, uh, in weather and climate research, such as much machine learning, which is uh, it's coming from the field of uh, 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 well social sciences, or at least the uh, the, uh, the uh, interest in uh, uh, metrics in Facebook and Google. Um, so probably lots of things to learn from them. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd like to uh, give the floor to Carlo uh, in case he wants to build on uh, some of the uh, issues that you've raised. Uh, Carlo, would you be happy to comment on some of these things? Sure. Uh, thank you, Paco. Um, well, I agree largely with what Mark has said, but there were some points um, uh, you know, worth emphasizing. I really appreciate what Marcus, Mark said in relation to the boundary between weather predictions and climate change and climate projection, because for many users, I mean, just repeating basically what Mark said, for many users, that boundary doesn't exist. It's something that exists within the community, it exists within uh, science and research, but doesn't exist for users. So finding a way of merging these two uh, is quite crucial, and I, I agree is a challenge we need to overcome. Um, there were a few other points worth uh, mentioning. <coughs> One was in relation to uh, high resolution. You know, I think both Mike and I emphasize this need coming from the user having high resolution um, information, you know, point information, regional information, and so on. 
And, and I want to emphasize that this needs to come alongside an evaluation of the quality of that information at that scale. Because if you just listen to the user, they want to have the information about the backyard, no matter what. And often, this is not in their best interest because the quality or the usability of that information is not what they expect it to be. So I don't know if it's a matter of just communication of, of uncertainty, as, as Mark was referring to, but I think that the two aspects should go hand in hand. So high resolution with, with sufficient quality um, uh, information for the user to understand uh, that the, the highest resolution may not necessarily be in their best interest. Um, and this links to uh, to metadata, and as Paco and uh, a few other people who are attending the meeting today know, I think this is really important. It's probably representing one of the biggest challenges if, you want, if we want climate services to thrive and succeed. You know, having sufficient uh, metadata and sufficiently clearly, clear metadata and uh, homogeneous throughout the different data sets I think is really crucial for the success of the climate service. Because if we want interoperability, if we want transparency and traceability, then the metadata needs to be there, needs to be clear, needs to, needs to be uh, you know, standard and standardized. And I like to think that initiatives such as Copernicus can play a role in pushing a standard you know, through the community and through the community of users. Um, <clears throat> the final point, which is, um, um, well, I think I, I partially covered it with high resolution, um, but it, it's linked more widely to skill and uncertainty. Again, if, if you look at, um, at the users, I mean, the users of, uh, we have engaged with, with the cooperative climate change services um, in, in the different contract, well, many users are, would, would love to use seasonal prediction, uh, but they don't because they feel the quality of that information is not sufficient to trigger action. So I think this, you know, going back to, to the climate science community, I think there is an interest there and there is something we can work on, you know, if we were to, to develop uh, more reliable and more skillful prediction on time horizon of few, you know, one to three months, uh, there, there would be a market for it. People would be very keen to use them. Uh, but as they are at the moment, there is reluctance uh, in engaging with that because the added value is too little uh, for the extra, you know, for the burden of, of um, that comes with dealing with a complex data set and uh, with a technology that is quite new. Um, the, the, I, I found the, the, the presentation very interesting. There would be certainly many other points to, to discuss, but I stop here for, for sake of time. Okay, thanks a lot, Carlo. Um, I, I wonder if anyone from the floor uh, wants to raise any issues. I see that Mike also uh, wants to say something else. Do you want to add something, Mike? Uh, yeah, just about this uh, point. I mean, I, I fully agree with Carlo's comment. Uh, uh, I, I just would like to add uh, this, the topic of the localized information. Uh, I mean, this is indeed, I mean, everybody would like to get information in his backyard. This is, is clear. But on the other side, most decision processes are not on a backyard scale. So uh, I think uh, one has to separate between applications or users that really live in a backyard and uh, and applications that want the information on a backyard but then aggregate the information uh, after the analysis again to a national scale or to even on a on a continental scale and uh, in such situation i think you um uh, you average out uh, well actually i'm convinced and we we could also uh, see that for example in these roads out uh, study that you average out some of these uncertainties. So if you if you need to understand uh, how much road salt will be used in this particular hundred meters of a road, then you, you will uh, you will struggle. But at the end, the road salt production is for entire Switzerland. So so they need information for entire Switzerland. So but nevertheless, you need the localized information to match the climate with the with the with the road and or the streets. So there is, I think it's, a, it's, not, it's, it's actually quite a complex topic, uh, how localized information uh, we should provide and uh, how uh, this information is then used afterwards. So it's, it's yeah, <laughs> it's not so easy. But um, um, I'm open and I'm also uh, curious if there are some other questions or inputs from the audience. 
Okay, thanks a lot, Mark. Uh, we can spare five more minutes before before we close the webinar. We we are running uh, running over the uh, the expected time. Uh, is there anyone who wants to raise a point or even uh, uh, make a, uh, a question to uh, uh, Mark and Carlo? Okay, silence radio. <laughs> uh, very good. So we can probably stop it here. And uh, uh, well, it, it, uh, yeah, I just want to raise that uh, all the information will be available on the uh, Climate, uh, Climate Europe uh, website, uh, both the uh, presentations, the uh, recording uh, of the, uh, the, the presentations and the discussions, and even a summary for those who are very busy and uh, only have some time in the underground to read a few lines about what happened uh, here today. Um, I don't want to close uh, without uh, thanking both uh, Carlo and Mark. Uh, that was very interesting what you showed, and uh, it, it really helps both the uh, the uh, activities in the, in the Climate Europe uh, project, but also it helps a lot in documenting some of the experiences that uh, can really make a difference on uh, where we are going to get in a few months and years uh, from now. Uh, in the field of uh, the provision of uh, useful or uh, at least action-oriented climate information. So thanks very much. Uh, and uh, thanks uh, also to those who attended the, uh, the webinar. And uh, we uh, will announce the next webinar in a, in a couple of days. Uh, and they will take place in uh, around a month uh, from, from now. So uh, thanks very much and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.